Hello again, grade nines. This is lesson two, part one. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through some of the exercises together and make sure that everyone understands what's going on. And then we're going to look at unbalanced forces. Um, so remember I said in the last uh, lesson, I said to you, if the forces are balanced, the object is going to stay at the same velocity or the same acceleration. And um, it, or it's going to stay at rest. Now we're going to look at what happens when the forces are unbalanced. They're not the same. Okay, so let's go into a few of the examples, make sure everyone understands what's going on, and then we'll, we'll go to the theory and the concept of unbalanced forces. So I'm going to work very quickly through these examples, so please make sure that you mark your work, make sure that you understand exactly what's, go what's going on, and I'm going to try and mark with you. So one of the first things that you need to uh, look at is question two. So we did question one in the previous video, and that is what is the mass of, of an object that has the weight of 14 newtons? So now you are going to manipulate the formula that we taught you, because we, we've already got force, we've already got gravitational acceleration. The thing we're looking for is mass. So you're going to take that 14 newtons and divide it by 9.8, and therefore you are going to get a, a mass of 4.08 kilograms. So what am I giving you a mark for? I'm giving you a mark for the formula, I'm giving you a mark for the substitution, and I'm giving you a mark for the answer. And this is very important, grade nines. Please make sure that you fill in the um, um, units. It's very, very important. Question three um, asks, draw a free body diagram of the following scenarios. So if you got this wrong, please don't stress. It does take some practice, but you'll see now it's actually quite easy. The first one is a cell phone that lies stationary on a desk. In other words, it's not moving. So what, what are the two forces that are play here? Remember, normal force is a stationary force, and it's, it's upwards, it's perpendicular from the object. This is my object here. This is my cell phone. This is my normal force. and then I will always have gravity, which is FG. Please make sure you put the abbreviations on. So for something like this, you could get three or two marks. You could get a half a mark for each of the uh, for the for the labels and one mark for the for the actual object. It just depends on how the how the question's been asked. But yeah, I'm just going to show one, two, or three um, uh, marks for this question. Question 3.2 says a car parked on a steep driveway. So here comes the whole incline, um, incline um, uh, um, surface into, into play. So the first thing you need to identify is that there is going to be, um, there is going to be your, this is your surface here. Let's draw the surface. I can't draw it straight because I'm trying to navigate with my mouse, but just imagine that you can maybe even draw with a pencil like a, a, an incline, a diagonal line, and your object is lying on there. Okay, here we have normal normal force, which is perpendicular from the object, so look now, it's not completely straight, it's at an angle. Then you have gravitational force, which is always straight down, and you have frictional force, because remember that friction is opposing the applied it's, put, it's opposite to the applied force. All right. Okay, we're going to go, carry on to um, question four on the next slide. All right, so before we get to question four, there is 3.3. .3. It's an umbrella floating down towards the ground. Remember what I said to you guys about large surface area and light and mass. An umbrella is typically light and mass, and it's got a large surface area. So there's going to be quite a lot of air resistance there. The air resistance is opposing the gravitational force. So you're going to draw air resistance upwards and gravitational force downwards, because what is gravity doing? It's pulling the object down. What is air resistance doing? It is pushing the object up. So over here, we're going to get a mark for air resistance, a mark for your object, and a mark for gravity. Then, question four. Majestic Bob is an, an um, astronaut which has landed on the surface of the moon. He notices that he is able to jump much higher on the moon than he can on Earth. Okay, here, this question, you guys should have looked this up. Has his mass changed? Okay, explain your answer. Right, in this question, his mass has not changed, guys, at all. 
We didn't mention any change in mass. He's still, he's still the same mass. His mass is the same as it is on Earth, but the moon um, um, and the moon, as this is the amount of matter in his body. So there's two, for a question like this, you're going to get a mark for saying no. Then you're going to get a mark for your explanation. So please fill these in, make sure that you've marked everything, and then we'll carry on to the next section. So great nines, you weren't expected to do these questions, so these questions we're going to do together. So I'm just going to see if I can enter some of the answers in. Um, yes, there we go. So this should be on page five of your notes, it's question 4.2. And I don't want you to feverishly write in answers yet. I want you to just listen, and then you can fill in the answers. The moon is much smaller and lighter than Earth. Remember that? Smaller and lighter on Earth. So, therefore, it affects its acceleration due to gravity. Do you think it is greater or less than the acceleration due to gravity on Earth? The, 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 the huge thing here is that the clue here is that it's telling you that the moon is smaller and lighter on Earth. Remember, less mass, less gravitational acceleration. Therefore, we're going to have less weight. Okay, so that's what they're asking here. They're asking about gravitational force. So it's going to be less acceleration due to the gravity. Less acceleration due to the gravity. What effect will this have on his, um, on its weight? So please, it's not a his, it's its weight. Explain your answer. Okay. Oh, we, oh sorry, we are referring to uh, Majestic Bob now. We're not referring to the moon. So it is a his. I do apologize. He will have a lower weight as Gravitational force is directly proportional to gravitational acceleration. The more gravitational acceleration, the more the weight, guys. Okay, so please fill this in. So how will this, this question is about how this affects the weight of Majestic Bob. And he is going to have a lower weight because the gravitational acceleration is a lot lower. So continuing on with page five's calculations, let's look at 4.4. Now, remember, all of these questions are related. So try and work from the previous answer because that's really going to help you. And if don't worry about getting, if you get things wrong in the test and exam, because if you get it wrong, we have continued accuracy. So we do mark you for, mark you right. And we look at carryover error. Anyway, let's carry on with 4.4. Explain why he is able to jump higher using your answers above. So guys, he is able to jump higher as a gravitational force it, pulling him downward is a lot less than on Earth. So if the force is greater, then he is not going to be able to, to counteract gravity. He's not going to be able to jump super high. But when gravity is, or gravitational acceleration is less, he is able to lift off the ground or lift off the moon a lot easier. Okay, so please fill this in, and, 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 and I hope you are getting this. I hope this is making sense for you. Remember what we've said before. If you ever get stuck, please drop us a message, and we'll help you out. Then at the bottom of the page, there is a few facts on Jupiter. I hope you please read those facts and let's see if you can answer the question. It says there, look at the information provided about Jupiter from this website. Can you find the mistake and how would you correct it? Okay, so there is one thing that's correct here and then there's also a, another problem. There's like one error. So there's one thing I want you to identify as correct and one that is incorrect. Okay, so the answer that I've written down is that they state that your weight could change, um, which is true, the weight could change because remember that gravitation acceleration, but the units are not in kilograms, okay? They are confusing mass and weight. So there's a whole bunch of bullet bullet points there. I want you to read that and maybe just on the side identify like a circle or highlight where they went wrong just for yourself so you can understand exactly what is going on here.
On page six of your notes, you will see um, number two, which is unbalanced forces. That's what we're going to do now. And I've already, I've already hinted at a lot of this. You guys should know this by now. Um, it, it, it's pretty straightforward. I don't think you're going to struggle with this at all. Unbalanced forces is when the opposing, the applied force and the opposing forces or the opposite force are not equal. Okay, and therefore the net force that is generated or the resultant force, okay, is going to be influenced by the unbalanced force. So there's a few examples we've got here. We've got, um, we've got a team that is playing tug of, tug of war. In the first um, example, you will see that 300 newtons are moving to the left and 300 newtons are moving to the right. So therefore the force is balance there's no net force there's no overriding force there's no resultant force it's zero zero newtons guys in the second example you have 400 newtons moving to the left and 300 newtons moving to the right therefore you have 100 newtons um, left and that 100 newtons is moving to the what it's moving to the left we call Force. So force that is measured in newtons is a vector. What is a vector? It's a physical quantity that has direction and magnitude. What is the magnitude here? The magnitude is the 100 newtons. What is the direction? It is left. Okay. The second example that we have here is a truck moving. Okay. The truck is moving it is speeding in the direction. It's going towards the right based on the image. Okay. There is a bigger force moving to the right, it's 100 newtons, and the smaller force, which would be your frictional force, is 60 newtons. So what is my resultant force here? Grade nines, the resultant force is going to be 40 newtons to the right, or my net force. So I use those two terms interchangeably. It's what is left. That's what it means after you've done the deduction. It's resultant or net. Either way, you're still going to get the mark. Okay, so so I hope this is this is making sense. So when an object is moving at a certain speed or moving at a, or at rest, there's something that relates to the fir, Newton's first um, law of motion, and it's called the law of inertia. Now inertia is a tendency of a body or an object to resist a change in motion or, or in um, rest. The object does not want to change what it's doing. The object does, wants to continue moving at the same speed and, and um, wants to con continue moving at the same acceleration. As soon as you apply an unbalanced force, so for example, with a truck, okay, there's going to be a change of motion. There's going to be a Inertia, inertia meaning the object does not want to slow down. So there is a brief moment before there is a change. There is a brief moment where the object resists the change. An example of this could be in, um, let's think about when you stop um, at a traffic light with your parents in the car. Um, your mom and your dad will put the car in first gear, okay, and wait until the traffic light turns green. Then. When the traffic light turns green, he or she will check to see that everything is safe before pulling off of, of the stop sign or off the um, traffic light. If the traffic light, what happens in that mo in that split motion uh, or moment, okay, before the car pulls off, the car resists a change of motion. It wants to stay at rest. So I don't know if you've noticed there is a split second before the car moves off or starts moving that my friends is inertia it will take you a while to get used to this um concept but i promise you like i said before lots of practice and you guys will be golden so page six at the top of page six i want you to fill in these details um this is exactly what i've just told you before in the previous slide you're just putting it all together now you're just writing it down so when forces are balanced they will stay at they are in equilibrium what does it mean they are equal everything is fine they're going to continue at the same pace or they're going to stay at rest and one of two things can happen as a result of this either the object which the forces are acting on it will remain at rest because it's at balance 
or the object in motion will continue at a constant velocity or speed. So it will continue driving, the car will continue driving at 120 kilometers an hour. Okay. The property of objects wanting to stay in motion is called inertia. Inertia. When forces are unbalanced, then they cause the object that they're acting on it to change speed and velocity. Now remember, this change in speed and velocity could be a decrease or an increase. Okay, so make sure you fill, it, fill all of these little details in. And what it basically is saying is that that car that's driving at 120 kilometers an hour, you now speed up. Now you want to drive at 130 kilometers an hour or 140 kilometers an hour. There's going to be a moment where the object or the car resists that change. And that is what inertia is. Okay, because now all of a sudden you are applying a greater force. So the forces are unbalanced. So what I have done is I filled this in for you so that you can actually completely understand what's going on here with unbalanced forces. We can ask a question like this in a test on exam, so please be cognizant of this. There's a box on the side, and that's showing you the forces and the different directions of these forces. And I want to actually just bring this all home, consolidate this, and make sure that you understand what it means. Number one is showing five newtons and five newtons that are moving to the right so together if we have to add those together what what is our resultant force 10 newtons to the right question two is showing five newtons moving from the left and five newtons moving from the right therefore my resultant force is going to be zero newtons because they cancel each other out as just like electrostatics what do i always say to you if we've got um, um, six protons and we have six new, uh, six electrons, um, what is going to happen? It's going to cancel each other out. So there's not going to be any overriding, overarching or overall resultant charge. Same thing here, same concept here, except we're using force. Number three is got five newtons and then eight newtons, which equals to 13 newtons. And which direction is it? Right. When we look at vectors, there's always a direction. Then question four shows no what, what should actually be written in there, and I want you to write it in for yourself now, just to make sure that everyone's got it because we didn't fill it in into the books. I want you to just write there five. Five. Wait, hold on. Let me just rub that out. I don't think that's great. Let's try that again. I want you to write there five. Five. So then... You will have five newtons that are going to the left, and you have eight newtons that are going to the right. What is left? What are you left with, great dance? You are left with three newtons to the right. Okay. And then the last one, you've got seven newtons going up and seven down. They cancel each other out to get zero. So I really hope this makes sense. Please fill this in. Okay, and then once again, in the next um, lesson, we're going to go through Newton and his laws, as well as we are going to be looking at how you apply this resultant force, this net force within a formula. Okay.